hall. This is a massive <laughs> hall. Um, so thank you for having me. I just want to kind of get a feel of the people who are in this room. How many of you teach children or Sunday school? Teach the Bible to children or Sunday school? If that's you, just stand. Just stand where you are. Don't worry. There's no embarrassment here. Just stand where you are. Yay! Okay. Well done. Well done. Okay, stay standing. How many of you teach youth? Teenagers, so 13 to 18. Whether in, in Sunday school or in devotions of a, a class, anything like that. Anyone? Okay, we have one. <laughs> Guys are like teenagers in Mbala. Okay, two. Well done. Okay. How many of you teach the Bible to anyone? Whether it's a Bible study group, whether it's adults, how many of you teach the Bible to anyone? Anyone at all? Again, there is therefore now no condemnation for those of you who do not stand. Hallelujah. Okay. Thanks. Let's give these guys a hand as you sit. Um, I just wanted to get a feel of, of who's in the room. So please do me a favor with the person next to you. Please ask them, which subject did you used to fail in high school and why? Discuss. 20 marks. Given how long this is taking, I'm wondering how many subjects you used to fail. But the point is you're in university now. So there are some of us who got an A, there are some of us who got A, but it's fine. Either way, you made it to Campo. So I wish I could put the mic in everyone's hands, just because I'm really interested to know. But for the sake of clarity, anyone here say chemistry? Chemistry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are guys who are working their feet up. We love you guys. Anyone here say physics? Ah, uh, thanks. I don't get physics, by the way. It's like maths with, exp with explanations. Why? Why does that subject exist? But it's fine. Biology. Bio what? Biology is fun. You get to kata kata churas. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb here and guess. Mathematics. If your hand is down, you're a liar. Liar. You are going to hell tonight. Usirudanganye that used to understand trigonometry, calculus. Don't, don't lie to us. We all floated. Okay, you're not better than us. So the story is told of a, a guy who was in college and um, he had one course left to do so that he can maliza his courses. And he was like, I just need a course to get this over with. What's the simplest course? And he picked a course called Ornithology. Now my people are going Ornithangoa. Ornithology is the study of birds. Ah... It's a study of birds. So he figured, how hard can it be? We are going to some about birds, nyoni, winyo, ndege, however, whichever language you want to use. He's like, that can't be difficult. Turns out, ornithology was the hardest course in the university. I mean, this guy said he studied harder for that course than any course he had done. So he needed to know wingspans. He needed to know migratory patterns. He needed to know what they eat. He needed to know how their eggs look. He needed to know if they are birds of prey or if they are not birds of prey or if they are preyed upon by other birds. Like it was one big mess. But the guy studied hard and eventually came the finals, right? So he walks into a hall much like this hall and everyone is given their papers. It's a blank piece of paper with 35 spaces. And the lecturer walks in, he says, okay, this is your final exam. If you get this, you guys are good. I'm hoping that all of you pass. Here's your exam. And he projects on the screen pictures of 35 different bird species and tells the class, your task is to identify number one to 35. Only trick is these bird species, you have to identify them from their ankles down. Right? So this... College student is like, are you guy? 
excuse me, sir, we can't do this exam. This is not what, this was nowhere in what we studied for. The, the professor goes like, look, anything is up for grabs. This is what you studied for. This is the test I've brought. This is what you're doing. So the guy slams his books and says, I'm not doing this, and starts walking out. And the professor tells him, young man, can you tell me your name so that I write your name down and give you an F? And the guy goes, you tell me. You tell me what my name is, then I'll do your exam. Right? <laughs> and you guys are like, I wish I could do that to my lecture. <laughs> it's safe to say that that was a ridiculously unfair test. Right? And if we are honest, sometimes if we are asked to teach the Bible or rightly divide the word of truth or correctly handle the Bible, we kind of feel like that guy in the lecture theater. We're just like, ah, boss, this is a big book, eh? Where do I start? Okay? And I get it. I get it that sometimes you'd be asked and you'd shy away. Even on a one-on-one -on -one situation, I get that you'd shy away because you're going, look, me, I've read Matthew 18, 6. Jesus says, if you lead one of my little ones astray, you might as well put a millstone around your neck and jump into the ocean. So I don't want to lead anyone astray by teaching them the wrong thing. But on the other hand, let me commend you not only for being here, but for even desiring to teach God's word. Okay, that's a good, wonderful, noble thing that the word of God, especially the gospel, within that word may spread to the very ends of the earth. Okay? And part of why you have that desire is because of Matthew 28 from verse 19 to 20, which says, therefore, go and... My, oh, 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 oh. Hey, let's try this again. Therefore, go and... Make disciples. Everyone else is like, what a melon, what a melon. Go and make disciples of all nations. Doing what? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Do you catch that little word, teaching? Every single Christian on planet Earth who has ever existed, exists, or will ever exist has to teach God's word. This isn't something for professional pastors to do. This isn't something for your children's pastor or your youth pastor. Every single person in this room, if you call yourself a Christian, you have to teach God's word. Hakuna kuhepa. It's like tax. There's no hepa. In. Okay, well, actually, that's not true. People hepa tax all the time. The point is, there's no hepa. In. Why? If you are going to evangelize, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word about Christ. People do not get saved by watching your life. They get saved by you opening your mouth and me opening my mouth and telling them. Thus says the Lord, for God so loved you that he gave his only son. You get the picture? And even if you're not currently teaching in the children's ministry or the youth ministry, someday by God's grace, if you so choose and if he so calls you, you're going to be a husband or a wife and might be a mom or a dad. And it is your responsibility to teach God's word to your children, not the children's pastor, not the youth pastor. That one is on me, that one is on you. It's my responsibility as a dad to teach the word of God to my children. Deuteronomy 6. Teach your children when you stand and when you sit, when you go out and when you come in. Bind them on your heads, tie them to your hands, paint them on your gates, right? My responsibility, your responsibility. Every Christian has to teach God's word. So I want to demystify and blow up this idea that the only people who should rightly divide the word of truth, correctly handle the word of truth are pastors and preachers. That's not true. Granted, pastors and preachers have a much higher responsibility, a much stricter judgment because they are leading God's flock using God's word. So they better not put words in God's mouth. But every single Christian has this responsibility. Cool. So here's how I want us to spend our, our time together. Because there's, there's two big ways of handling God's word. The first big way is handling God's word devotionally. That means you wake up every morning or in the evening or at whatever time you choose, you have what we call quiet time. You pray, you read your Bible, you ask the Lord, Lord, teach me. If, if something jumps out at you, you're, you're seeing that there's something you need to believe, a command you need to obey, a place you need to repent. You're doing that on a personal one-on-one -on -one level, right? But today... We're going to spend a little more time on talking about how to handle God's word formally. Okay, this first way is how to God handle God's word informally, between you and God and scripture. But this one is a one where you're now teaching scripture to your children. 
You're now teaching the Sunday school children. You're now teaching the youth. You're now teaching the women's ministry. You're now teaching the men's ministry. How do you correctly handle this word of truth? The big idea is, ever heard of that idea of observe, interpret, and apply? Right? Observe what's in the Bible, interpret what's in the Bible, and apply. We're going to spend our time on that little middle piece, interpreting the Bible, understanding what it means and correctly handling it. The big word for that is hermeneutics. Okay? Uh, hermeneutics is a fancy word to explain the science of biblical interpretation. It's a big word that simply means the science of how to understand a text in its context. And that's what we are going to be talking through today. So in our time together, two big things I want us to do is look at broad principles of how we can properly, hey, properly, eh, properly, I beg your pardon, properly handle God's word. And then I'll leave some time for a short Q&A so that if anyone has questions, you can just ask it out loud. Okay? Sound good? Ayawa. Sound good? Okay, good. We're on the same page. Here's a, a sentence that we will be saying throughout this evening that I need you to say with me. Okay, it goes like this. I'll say the whole sentence, then I'll invite you to repeat after me. A text out of context is just a pretext for it to say anything you want it to say. Okay, so a text... Hey, so my index one. So let's go back to primary school. Students, repeat after me. A text... Ah, yeah, repeat after me. This is why guys flanked KCSE. What what chemistry? You are told to go to the pipette, you went to the burette. Repeat after me. A text out of context is just a pretext for it to say anything you want it to say. Okay, now all of us together on three. One, two, three. A text out of context is just a pretext for it to say anything you want it to say. Now on your own. Well done. If you're writing notes, that's the one you want to write down. Because that's the one we will be repeating. A text out of context is just a pretext. For those of you who are going, pretangoa, a pretext is a false idea or a pretense. It's just a pretext for it to say anything you want it to say. So we'll give the broad principles, and how we'll give the broad principles is by working our way through a text of scripture called, in the book of Isaiah, I beg your pardon, in the book of Isaiah chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles, switch them on and, and swipe to Isaiah chapter 6. That's where we're going to be hanging out. And I'll give the principle and show you how it works in actual hermeneutics, in actual proper biblical interpretation. Okay? So, Isaiah chapter 6. If you're there, let's repeat the, our, our running theme. A text... The first broad principle in understanding how to take a text within its context and not rip it out of its context is understanding the historical or cultural context. That's number one. Understand the historical or cultural context. Okay? The historical or cultural context is what gives the text significance in its own time period. What did the text mean? Why was the text such a big deal in that time? That's the first question we are asking. And how we get there is by asking, what is the, the, the historical or cultural context? The Germans call this the Sitzimleben. That's a fancy way of saying the life setting. What was life like at the time that this text was being written? Because when Genesis was being written, life was very different than when Isaiah was being written. And life was very different in the, from Isaiah's time than when Jude was being written. Does that make sense? So the better we understand what life was like, the more significance we'll see, oh, that's why he says this. Question, does the cultural context, does understanding what life was like change the meaning of the text? Absolutely not. It does not change the meaning, but what it does is it 
colors the meaning. It shows you why it was such a big deal. So Isaiah chapter 6, here's what it says. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Isaiah 6, 1. Here is how most people, not most people, that's not true. Here's how some people tend to preach that verse, especially when you're in high school. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Who is your Uzziah? Is it your boyfriend? He must die or else you will not see the Lord. Who is your Uzziah? Is it your girlfriend? She must die. Otherwise, you will not see the Lord. Because in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Hallelujah. What is your Uzziah? Is it money? Give it all to the preacher because it is holding you back from seeing the Lord. Ever heard anything like that? Immediately you know, ah, um, say, anatupaka, um, say, maze, bana. Right? Because that is a classic, whoa, okay, sorry. That is a classic mishandling. The first question you have to ask is, does this guy even understand the cultural or historical context? Now, many times these are well-meaning people but they've missed the historical or cultural context. So you have to ask, who is Uzziah? Why is Isaiah telling us about Uzziah? It can't be so that we randomly decide, you are the Isaiah, you must die. The Uzziah, rather, you must die. The cool thing about scripture is it tends to interpret itself. We are told about Uzziah in 2 Chronicles chapter 16. And what scripture says, I won't read the whole thing, but what scripture says is that this girl was actually for the most part, a good king. However, he got arrogant and got proud and then became a bad king. And there's something specific he did. So here's what Second Chronicles chapter 26 says about Uzziah. I'll just skim, skim through it. Because remember, we are asking what is that? Which context? Which kind of context? Ayo. The what? It begins with a H. Historical. There we go. So, Second Chronicles 26. Here's what it says. And when the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king instead of his father Amaziah, he built Eloth and restored it to Judah after the king slept with his fathers. Uzziah was 16 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. Verse 5, he set himself to seek God in the days of Zechariah who instructed him in the fear of the Lord. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. So for 52 years, for most of those 52 years, Uzziah was a good king. Uh, if you read the story, he protected their borders because the Babylonians had been eyeing them. He created some of the world's first aqueducts, basically pipelines for water so that people didn't have to go all the way to the river. He was a good king. But here's what scripture says. Verse 16, but when he was strong, he grew proud to his destruction, for he was unfaithful to the Lord his God and entered the temple, you want to remember that word, of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. But Azariah, the priest, went in after him with 80 priests of the Lord who were men of valor, and they withstood King Uzziah and said to him, it is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron who are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for you have done wrong, and it will bring you no honor from the Lord. Then Uzziah was angry. Now he had a censer in his hand to burn the incense, and when he became angry with the priest, leprosy broke out on his forehead. Verse 22, now the rest of the acts of Uzziah, from first to last, Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, wrote, and Uzziah slept with his fathers, and they buried him with his fathers in the burial field that belonged to the kings, for they said, he is a leper. Did you catch it? In the year that King Uzziah died, who was Uzziah? A king who had stabilized this nation for 52 years, had brought more technological and military advancement in Israel's history, even better than his dad, who, by the way, was a wicked king. And now, after 52 years of his reign, Israel is going, what shall we do? There's no one on our throne. After 52 years of his reign, he decided me and God are equals. See, God is a king. See, me, I'm a king. See, then I can just go do what the priests do because I'm a king. What he did not understand is the holiness of God. God does not play games with his character. So back to Isaiah 6. Why are we being told about the year that King Uzziah died? Three big reasons. Number one, Isaiah wants you to know when he's writing this. It's the equivalent of me saying, in the year of post-election violence, 
I saw the Lord. What year was that? 2007-2008. Just because Isaiah said that, now we know that this is happening anywhere between 750 to 770 BC, about 700 years before Christ was born. The second reason he's doing it is because Israel had attached all their hopes to this king who had been a good king and protected them, and now there's no one on the throne. But in the year that King Uzziah died, who's still on the throne? God's still on the throne. And Isaiah is making a point that kings come and go, but the king of kings stays exactly where he is. And he's seated on the throne. I love that picture. Again, when you understand the cultural context, kings would sit on their throne when all was well, when they're not freaking out. Have you ever noticed God is never harassed in heaven? He's not over there telling Michael, Michael, now look, there's another burst pipe. What's wrong with you? Eric Gabriel, come, come, come quickly. What, you people, what's going on with my kingdom? No. He's always calm. He's always seated. He's always sovereign. He's always in charge. Right? Isaiah is trying to communicate to his people based on their own cultural context, there is no vacant throne in heaven. Which means as God's people, we have not been abandoned. The third thing is communicating is be careful because the same way Uzziah messed around with the holiness of God, you need to know that this God is not just holy, he's supremely holy. He's setting us up to understand something. Does that make sense? This is why you need to know the historical and cultural context. Don't assume you know. It doesn't matter if you're teaching 10 years, 10 year olds about Jonah and the great fish. Understand what was life like at that time. Because if you don't do that, if I don't do that, we fall into this trap called allegorizing. That's a fancy way of saying we start looking for hidden meanings behind words. That Uzziah is actually your cold. And once your cold is gone, then you'll see the Lord. No. But it's an easy trap to fall into when we don't understand the historical context. You and I need to understand that we all have to handle God's word and that is a weighty responsibility. Just like Jesus said, we shouldn't lead people astray. But James 3.1 says, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we, teach, that, what, that we who teach, I beg your pardon, will be judged with greater strictness. Now granted, James was there talking specifically about pastor preachers, but for all of us, we need to be able to handle God's word well, and it begins with understanding the historical context. Why? Because our text... Wololo, wololo, eh, eh, yawa, yawa, ritur, wait, wait. Take two. One, two, three. It's just a read. For you to say anything you wanted to say. So that you don't go to a high school and start preaching to kids to kill their Uzziah. They'll all kill their physics teacher. But you tell them there's a God who's still on the throne. And he has not forgotten you. He never forgets his people. Number two. Once we understand the historical or cultural context, we need to understand the literary, it's a hard word, literary context. Okay? Literary context just means the literature in front of you, the actual words that are in front of you. When we understand the historical and cultural con context combined with the literary context, it not only tells us what the, why the passage was significant then, it tells us what the passage meant to its first hearers. Okay? Because the truth is, what it meant then is the same thing it means now. Okay? If you're writing it, write it down. What it meant then, 2,000, 3,000, 3,500 years ago in Genesis, is the same thing it means right now. It cannot have meant one thing to the Israelites in Exodus, and then mean a completely different thing for you and I in 2018. That's not how it works. God's word is eternal. Whatever it meant then, it means the same thing now. Even though life has changed, it means the same thing, and we'll get into why it means the same thing in a little bit. But the big idea is God hasn't changed. His word hasn't changed. Human nature hasn't changed. Whatever it meant then is the same thing it means now. So, a couple of questions you want to ask yourself when you're looking at the literary context is, what genre is this? What style of writing is this? 
Is this a historical book like Numbers or Chronicles? Is this a narrative telling us a story like Nehemiah and the Gospels? Is this a poet, poetic book? Is it poetry like Psalms or the Proverbs or Ecclesiastes? Is this a gospel which is close to narrative? Is it a letter like the epistles? Is it like Daniel and Revelation, a prophetic, apocalyptic book? Or Isaiah, is it a prophetic, what narrative are we dealing with here? What, rather, what genre are we dealing with here? Does that make sense? Because when we understand that, we won't misappropriate things. So when scripture says that God will make his enemies his footstool, we don't literally think God has ten toes and is over there clearing the earth. That's not what it means. It's poetry. So it's a picture of a king's complete dominion over all of his enemies. Right? When we say, the Lord said to my right hand, it's not like his right hand has a mouth so it can talk back. It's not like God has a right hand. Okay, he doesn't have body parts. He is God. But the right hand is strength. Right? So he says to the person on his right hand, who is Jesus, it's pointing forward. That's poetry. When it's a narrative, it's a story. And these storytellers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they all had a specific big point they were trying to bring through. So if you read a narrative like John, him, he tells you why he's writing the book, John 20, 31. I write these things that you may believe in the Son of God and that by believing you may have life. Matthew writes to tell you, oh, by the way, Jesus is the king. King of the Jews, king of the Gentiles, king of kings. Mark writes to tell you, Jesus is a servant. I came not to be served, but to serve. Luke tells you, this is the son of man. This guy identifies with all our problems better than you would think. They have a point they're driving through throughout their books. That's why you want to ask, what style of writing is this? Second thing you want to ask is, what do these words mean? Just because there are words on a page doesn't mean you and I understand them. Because there's a massive time gap. A massive time gap between now and when Jesus was walking this earth. There's an even bigger time gap between now and when Isaiah was writing what he's writing. So what do these words actually mean in their original? You don't have to know Greek. You don't have to know Hebrew. Don't feel that pressure. If you choose to, great. But you don't have to know that. You just have to know where to go for the right answers. What does this word mean? Okay? So I'll give you an example, and I, I genuinely don't mean to be offensive. When I was in USIU, um, there, were, there were a bunch of American students. So we were writing, and I turned to this girl and asked her, could I please borrow your rubber? And she gets red in the face. And she looks at me like, oh, what did you just ask me for? Why? There are some of you over there saying, no, we don't know, Pastor, we, we have no idea what you're talking about. What rubber means in Kenya is not what rubber means in America. A rubber in Kenya is that thing you use to rub away pencil marks. A rubber in America is a condom. So when I asked for a rubber, she was like, what is this guy asking me for? Right? Here's the deal. That one word that you gloss over, that I gloss over and think I know what it means in scripture, can mean something very different to the people who are writing it. Right? So you want to ask, what do these words mean? And take them within their context. So that you don't take one word, preach a 30-minute sermon from that word, and you've completely mangled the word. Here's an example. Butterfly. Okay, what is a butterfly? Anyone, just shout it. A what? An, an animal, an insect, the thing that flies around, right? But what if I said butterfly? This comes from butter and fly. Therefore, butterfly is floating margarine. Right? You'd be like, uh, bro, no. If there was floating margarine, Kenyans would just walk with their loaf like this and eat, right? But people do that with scripture all the time. All the time. And I don't want us to fall into that trap. We need to know what do these words mean and what are they saying. How are these words related to each other? How are these sentences or paragraphs related to each other? So Isaiah chapter 6. Verse 1. 
In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. That's part of cultural context. Why would Isaiah mention that the train of his robe filled the temple? Because in the time Isaiah was writing this, in the military, the size of your robe determined how much authority you had. So if your robe figured over here near your waist, you, you are the form one in the army, you're the crew too. If it gets down to your ankles, you're like a lieutenant. But only one person had a train of his robe that reached the floor. Who? The king. Isaiah said, the train of his robe filled the temple. It didn't just hit the ground. If he was sitting here in this hall, it would spread across this hall, go over Uhuru Highway, end up in Nakuru, go all the way to Mombasa, down to Johannesburg. In other words, this king's authority is everywhere, every time, all day, and twice on Sundays. This king is completely in charge of every speck of dust that is falling to the ground or every star that is being born or every hair that is falling from your head of every lecturer that refuses to give you the right grade he's in charge the train of his robe filled the temple that amen was for the lecturers but we love you anyway <laughs> verse 2 above him stood the seraphim each had six wings. With two wings, he covered his face. With two wings, he covered his feet. And with two wings, he flew. Love that verse. I'm trying not to get my skin to pop off here. but you, Literary context, what does the word seraphim mean? Right? Usually, we're just like, seraphim, moving on. We don't know what that is. Maybe it's a name for Sarah. Next. <laughs> no. That word seraphim means the ones who are on fire. Literally, the seraphim are ablaze with the adoration of God. And all day, they fly above him. Right? When we understand that, we get a picture of what our worship should look like. Not dead and cold, but we should be the ones on fire for God. Ablaze with the adoration of God. Unashamed of the gospel of Christ. Are you catching it? That's what happens when you know a literary context. And it says above him flew this seraphim with two wings they covered their feet, with two wings they covered their eyes, with two wings they flew. Think about that picture. This is why knowing what the words are saying matters. So here's the deal. God creates everything perfectly suited to its environment, right? So fish have gills because their immediate environment is air. Wait, let's try this again. Fish, yani samaki, wretch, they have gills because their immediate environment is water. Birds have wings because their envir immediate environment is. And my dad is extremely black because his immediate environment was Nyanza. Therefore, he needs to reflect the heat, right? These seraphim, these angels, who, by the way, we don't even know how big they are, what's their immediate environment? God! He gives them two, two wings to cover their feet. Because in scripture, feet are a mark of that which is created, not the creator. Which is why when Moses shows up in God's presence, God tells him, take off your, take off your sandals. You're in my presence. You're a creature. I'm the creator. Honor me. They cover their feet. They have two wings to fly. And they have two wings to cover their eyes. They are holy beings in the presence of a holy God. But God is so holy, God had to give them blinders so that they are not blinded by him. That's how glorious this God we are talking about is. That's how glorious his word is. And that's why we need to handle it correctly. It takes time. It's a lot of work. But it's worth it. Because when I realize that these beings are ablaze with the glory of God, and look at what they say in verse, verse 3. And one called out to another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations and the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called and the house was filled with smoke. Holy, holy, holy. Why does that matter? Why does knowing the literary context, those actual words matter? Think about it. God is good, right? 
Eh. So yeah, well, do we need to replay the lady who asked, do you believe in God's unconditional? Is God good? Where in the Bible does scripture say good, good, good is the Lord God Almighty? God is patient. Don't get Where in the Bible does it say patience, patience, patience is the Lord of hosts? God is love, First John 4, 8, right? Does the Bible ever say love, love, love is the Lord of hosts? Ever? No? This quality of God is the only superlative quality of God. In other words, if you're going to get God, you start here. In Hebrew, when you wanted to make a point, you said it twice. For example, if something was really gold, you'd say this is gold, gold. If it was a deep pit, you'd say it's a pit, pit. All the time in the Gospels, you hear Jesus say, truly, truly. In other words, pay attention. The only superlative quality of God is that he is holy, holy, holy. Completely separated from sin. Completely pure. Completely beautiful. There is nothing in existence like him. He is set apart. And these seraphim shout that out. And scripture says, verse 4, think about these words you're about to read. Because when you're teaching, it will matter. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. Think about thresholds. Thresholds is doorposts. Are you seeing these things under the exits? Those are doorposts. These inanimate parts of creation had the good sense to tremble in the presence of God. Who are we not to? Isaiah is making a massive point here. He's saying when God shows up, eh, things tremble. As they should. One of the ways I know that someone doesn't know God is they, th they treat God like he's my homie. They think God is just like them, maybe a little bit bigger, has bigger shoulders and a big chest. They're like, ah, yeah, God, my man. Guys, there's no one in the Bible who met God and reacted like that. No one. Moses almost passed out. John saw him and passed out in Revelation. Peter saw him, jumped out of the boat and said, depart from me, I'm a wicked man. Zechariah saw him and freaked out. Mary was scared, so the angel had to tell her, don't worry. No one sees God and is like, hey, you guys, it's God. <laughs> no one. Do you see the point here? If we understand what the words mean, we can do justice when we are explaining the text. Because guys, when you're explaining the holiness of God to your children, they need to know it. Because if they don't know it, they'll think, I'm fine. If I die, I'll be fine. Only problem is, you will come face to face with a holy God. If God wasn't holy, there'd be no problem. The problem is he's holy. What does that look like? There's a chap called Yuza who touched the ark. And he was trying to stabilize it. It was on the back of, a, of an ox cart. You'll get this story in 1 Samuel chapter, I think, 16. I mean, 2 Samuel chapter 16. And they were transporting the ark of God. The ark of God was where God's presence dwelt. It's where his holiness dwelt. And when it was about to fall, Yuza, being the nice guy, said, let me stabilize it a bit. But when something holy comes into contact with something sinful, one of you is dying. And for the record, it's not God. That's why this matters. We need to know the literary context. And then third, we need to know not only the historical context, the literary context, but lastly, we need to know what the genuine parallels are between that time when it was being written and now when it is being written. Because like I said earlier, God doesn't change. He's holy and loving. Man doesn't change. We are still sinful, though we are made in the image of God. God's word doesn't change. First Peter 1, I think it's 15. The word of the Lord stands forever. And Christ doesn't change. Christ doesn't change. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5. And I said, woe is me, 
for I am lost. For I am an, a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. That, that little word, woe, why we need to understand what it means. Do me a, a favor. Just flip a couple of pages back. Um, I don't know where to start. Let's start somewhere fun like Isaiah chapter 3. Okay? Let's not even go far. Isaiah chapter 3 verse 11. If you have your Bibles, whenever you see the word woe, just shout it out. Okay? So chapter 3 verse 11. Let's go. To the wicked it shall be ill with them. For what his hands have dealt out shall be done to him. Chapter 5. Just for the, for the interest of time. Verse 8. My, oh. Okay, verse 8. <laughs> to those who join house to house, who add field to field until there's no room, and you are made to dwell alone in the midst of the land. Verse 11. Woe to those who rise early in the morning that they may run after strong drink who tarry late in the evening as wine influences them. Verse 18. To those who draw iniquity with cords of falsehood, who's, who draw sin as a cart with ropes. Verse 20. To those who call evil good. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 5. And I said, is who? Did you catch it? You caught it, right? For five chapters he was saying, woe to you, woe to you, woe to you. And now he says, woe is? Why? Because five minutes in God's presence, no, more like one second in God, God's presence, and he realized, those are me. He says, I'm a man of unclean lips. What do you mean, Isaiah Bana? You have the cleanest lips in the kingdom. You're the prophet. But it's the first time Isaiah actually saw Isaiah for who Isaiah really is, a sinner. All this time, Isaiah had been comparing himself to other people. And then he realized, other people are not the gauge, bro. God is. And compared to him, he would eventually say in Isaiah 64 verse 6, my righteous acts are like filthy rags. In the original language, it reads this way. All our righteous acts are like a used menstrual cloth. In other words, do whatever you're doing. You are still a filthy sinner in God's presence. I'm a filthy sinner in God's presence. And that little word, woe, is me. You know, we look at that word and we must say, we think of a guy in Britain in 1922 wearing a top hat with a walking stick. Oh dear. Whoa, is me. That's not what the word means. Anyone here ever gone for a Luya or a Luo funeral? Anyone? No? Yes? Okay. You know what that woe is? It's not woe. It's woe! That's what it is. Because the, the minute he saw God, he realized, Mazi, I'm done. Exodus says no one can look upon God, God and live. So he knew how this ends. He knew what happened to, to user. This is the first time in scripture something doesn't happen to him. It's the first time in scripture. And we need to know that. We need to explain that our God is holy. But, let's work our way through this text. Verse 6. By the way, verse 6 to 8 are like my favorite verses here. Yeah, but then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongues from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Think about each of those words, guys. Let's read it again. Then one of the seraphim, seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal. Remember that? That he had taken with tongues from where? From the altar. Literary context. What happens on an altar? It's not rocket science. Talk to me. There's sacrifice. That's what happens on an altar. This angel grabs coal from an altar and brings it to Isaiah. Here's the picture. A sacrifice had already been made. The way a burnt offering worked is you took an unblemished lamb, slit its throat, cut it up into pieces, burned it up, and after it had been burned, then you've made a sacrifice. That sacrifice is now being applied to Isaiah. 
It is a picture of the cross 770 years before Christ was even born. He was the unblemished lamb that was killed on our behalf. That sacrifice when applied to me who has faith in him means my guilt is taken away and my sin atoned for. That's why this matters. Because scripture always points to one guy, Jesus. In Luke chapter 24 verse 27, after the resurrection of Christ, Jesus is walking with these guys who don't seem to know that he has resurrected on the Emmaus road. And scripture says in Luke 24 verse 27, you want to write that down, it's a brilliant scripture. It says that Jesus, starting with Moses and the prophets, showed them all the things concerning himself. Think about that. Jesus has just risen. He could walk through a wall to show them that he's the Christ. He could make a plant instantly grow. He could make them two inches taller if he wanted to. Instead, this is where he goes. As everything flies out. <laughs> this is where he goes to show them that he is the Christ. He goes back to the word that we handle every day. Guys, if you and I are not preaching or teaching Christ crucified, we are not preaching or teaching. Paul said we preach Christ and him crucified. If we are not doing that, if the text doesn't point to end up at Jesus, it's not a sermon, it's a synagogue talk. The end point of a lecture is information. You guys know that. The end point of a motivational talk is action steps. But the end goal of a sermon or biblical teaching is worship. And they will not worship him if they do not know him. And they will not know him unless we tell them about him. And faith will not come to them unless they hear the word of Christ. And after Isaiah is saved, scripture says, and I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then I said, here I am. Send me. That's a big deal. Because Christian Lawanda's heart and every heart in here, we are happy to come to God and say, here I am. Send my brother. Here I am. Send him. Right? And his task was not easy. Scripture says that he'd talk to a people who'd con re like consciously refuse to hear him. In fact, they'd end up killing him. But he said, here I am. Send me. When you're looking for genuine parallels in scripture, you and I have to ask ourselves questions like, has my guilt been atoned for? Has my sin been taken away? These people I'm talking to, is that true of them? And maybe you're here and you're not a Christian. You just kind of wandered out in here because you didn't have money to go to the club. We are really glad you're here. There is a God who died on your behalf so that your sin may be atoned for and your guilt taken away. And if you repent and believe, you turn away from your sin and trust in him, you will be saved and have eternal hope and eternal joy. Not when you die from now for the rest of your eternal life. When you're looking for genuine parallels, we have to look at the people we are teaching and asking, if this guy died today, where are they going? We have to look at them and say, even if they are born again, do they get that Christ is all they need? Even if they are born again, are they willing to say, here I am, send me, not send him. So let's bring it to a close. Then I'll open it up for a few questions. I think I'm over time, but I'll open it up for a few questions. Number one, because we all have to teach, we start by praying. Pray before you teach. Pray before you teach. Teaching is not just a skill. It is a spiritual activity. It is a spiritual activity. If you read through the book of Acts, the advance of the gospel happens in response to prayer a lot of the time. So in Acts chapter 2, they are in the upper room praying. The Holy Spirit shows up. Peter preaches. 3,000 guys get saved. In other words, the gospel advances after they pray. In Acts chapter 4, when Peter and John have been harassed by the Sanhedrin, they come back and they pray and scripture says the room was shaken and the word of God was proclaimed by them. In Acts chapter 6, 
Peter says, we cannot ignore the ministry of the word and prayer. So set aside some deacons. In Acts chapter 10, Peter is in the rooftop praying when he receives a vision, goes down, preaches to Cornelius, and the whole household is saved, and the Gentiles come to Christ. In Acts chapter 13, they are fasting and praying, and the Holy Spirit says, set aside Paul and Barnabas to do my work, and they become the world's first missionaries. Do you see the picture? The advance of the gospel happens in response to prayer. That's how it's rigged to work. That's why God says, ask me of nations. Ask me for main campus. Get on your knees for that and I will empower you to evangelize and the gospel will spread. Pray before you teach, not only because that's how the gospel spreads, but that is how Christians become mature. When you have the time, you don't have the time now, but please read through Paul's prayers. In Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1, you will see him say, I pray that they may grasp how high and deep and long and wide is the love of God for them in Christ Jesus and to know this love that surpasses all knowledge and to be built into the full measure of the fullness of God. He's praying for their maturity. In Philippians, he says, praying for you, that, praying for you knowing this, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. He will make you mature. What is the end goal of teaching? Don't we want people to be mature in Christ? Jesus says that's not going to happen if you're not praying for them. You can teach a great lesson. Dude, a Muslim can do that. But this is a spiritual activity, not just a skill. Number two, read through the text severally and carefully. Read it in three to six different versions. ESV, NIV, NASB, pick whichever one you have. Read it in several versions. Read it devotionally. If you're going to teach on a Sunday from Isaiah chapter 6, make that your quiet time for the whole week or make it a separate time of study or devotionally but then also read it to study find out what those words mean if you don't know consult a study bible consult your pastor ask for a good commentary but find out what those words mean and lastly read it with your audience in mind <laughs> there's a story told of watson and sherlock holmes and <laughs> and we'll close with this the story told of Watson and Sherlock Holmes. So they had gone to camp and they, they had a little bit too much um, liquid courage. They drank a little bit too much. They weren't drunk, but they were a little inebriated. So they set up tent and they fall asleep. And then at around 3 a.m., Sherlock Holmes wakes up and he's looking at the stars. And he wakes up Watson. He's like, Watson, what do you see? And Watson says, I see stars, Sherlock, I see stars. Orologically, that tells me it's about 3 a.m. in the morning. Theologically, that tells me God made us and we are in a span, a massive universe, finding out how we can know this God. Ontologically, that means I'm actually here and this universe is actually here. How about you, Sherlock? What do you see? And Watson, rather Sherlock looks at Watson and says, Watson, you idiot, it means that someone stole our tent. That's why we can see the stars. <laughs> Guys, when you teach, don't try to be clever. Try to be clear. Okay? Don't try to be clever. Don't try to tell them about the ontological trinity and the subplasarian propitiation of the Son of God. No. Just be clear. There's a reason why when Jesus opened his mouth, five-year-olds, 15-year-olds, and 50-year-olds understood him just fine. Don't try to be clever. Try to be clear. But also remember, the word you are teaching, you have to be submitted to. Not perfectly, but genuinely. So one last illustration as we close, for real this time. When you're teaching, think of a balloon, right? If I gave you a balloon, and told you, I want this thing to float, okay? And you blow into it. How would you keep it floating? Talk to me. How would you keep the thing floating? You've blown air into it. How do you keep that balloon floating? How do you prevent it from hitting the ground? You what? Yeah, say it. You chapa chapa the thing, right? We loved doing it as kids. You keep chapa chapa the thing. But if I tell you, what if you fill this thing with a different gas and make sure it floats, what will you do? 
This is where the intelligence of University of Nairobi students is tested. What will you do? How will you keep it floating? Say what? A student right there. She said, do you want to just shout it? If you fill it with helium, it will go up. And just because that was such a brilliant answer, let me give you an ESV Global Study Bible. So that the next time you're teaching, you know where to go looking for answers. You fill the thing with helium and you don't have to smack it around, right? Guys, the gospel is like helium. If all you and I do is teach our kids, teach our students, teach our children, read your Bible more, pray more, what's wrong with you? Stop having sex. Stop going to the club. They'll stop coming to you. Because every time they come, you're just chapa chapaing them. But if every time you present to them the gospel, the goodness of God that leads to repentance, if every time you remind them you are not what you were, you are a now new creation, and God will sanctify you, your helium might leak, you give them more helium. Our teaching has to end up in Christ. And it will only end up there if we take a text in context. Why? Because a text out of is just a for it to say anything you wanted to say. Let's pray real quick and then I'll take two questions or three. Father, thank you for your word that is living and active and sharper than a double-edged sword. Lord, would you help us take a text in context? There's much we have talked about today and it's like drinking water out of a fire hose. But I pray you would remind us to do the hard work of taking a text in context. Because that's where your beauty and your glory is seen in the cross. And every scripture finds its telos, finds its end in you. So would you help us teach Christ and him crucified to our children, to our friends, to our neighbors, to the guys here on main campus. Would you help us open up our mouths and share the gospel? Because that is one way of teaching them who Christ is and what he has done for faith comes by hearing. We pray these things for your glory and our joy, believing and trusting in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to ask the first question, then open it up for a couple of questions. Please ask the person next to you, what is the one thing you will take home from today's session? Discuss. Two minutes. So as you continue discussing, I don't know how the lessons will, I mean the questions will work. Do I give you the mic? Do I wait? Can you just shout it from there? I don't know how this works. I guess if you have a question, just stand and shout. I think you're loud enough to be heard, I think. Whether it's specific to what we've talked about or something else. If I don't know, I'll tell you I don't know. <laughs> 
Yeah. Can you can you shout it or no? Okay. Praise the Lord, church. Praise the Lord again. I want to thank our pastor for this exposition tonight. Uh, it has been great, and I want to thank the, the uh, administration of our union for inviting such a preacher. Be blessed a lot. Yeah, I, I would want to ask the question on majorly these verses of the Holy Spirit have been done injustice to. How I would want you to help us to really put them to context and also the many verses in scripture on witchcraft, example, that we can kill a witch by our mouth, <laughs> such verses, and also Isaiah 54, verse 17, where we are told that we, we can declare things. So I would want you to help us to put those verses to context uh, so that the people who are here really can take the gospel out because this auditorium is big and not everyone is here. At least the, the gospel can go out. Thank you. Okay, your name is? Edgar. Thanks, thanks. Now there's a, a whole slew of questions you've asked there. Ah, okay. And I mean, we can have a conversation after this because I'll, I'll stick around for a bit. But let me try and hit some big, some big notes. You, you started out by talking about the Holy Spirit, verses concerning the Holy Spirit. Big picture, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity, equal in deity to the Son and the Father. Um, he's the one who regenerates, he gives us life. Um, he strengthens us, scripture says, do not be drunk on wine, but be filled with the Spirit. There's a parallel there. Same way, you have to do something to get drunk on wine, right? Guys are like, no, we, we don't know. We don't understand how that biology works. There's something you have to do, right? You have to drink for you to get drunk, right? And the parallel he's drawing is to be filled with the Spirit is not necessarily a one-time event. The same way you have to keep taking alcohol to keep getting high, you have to keep being filled with the Holy Spirit. How the verses before that and after that tell us by singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in your heart. Um, that's how you're filled with the Spirit. And the mark of being filled with the Spirit is not that you speak in tongues. Yes, Pentecostals, I know you're about to shoot me. That's not the mark. The mark that you are filled with the Holy Spirit is found in Galatians 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. That's the mark. So, how does the Holy Spirit, and I might be drawing a, a, a false link here, how does the Holy Spirit help us in situations of witchcraft or that sort of thing? Or what do we do with witchcraft and that sort of thing? Firstly, it's to recognize witchcraft is real. It's a, it's a fancy way. So in 1 Samuel, you'll see that with the witch of Endor as she conjures up Saul, which was probably a demon. It's just people moving in the demonic. The good news is, the response to that is not to hold someone with one finger on the top of their head and say, fire! And then the demons run. The response to that is to share the gospel. Because where Christ is, they cannot cohabit with demons. Right? It's either him there or them there. Right? That's why we share the gospel. And when they come to Christ, then we don't have to worry about witchcraft and demons. It's called a power encounter. And people think whenever you say power encounter, people think Nigerian movie. No. A power encounter is when the powers of the enemy come face to face with the power of love and truth in the gospel. That's the big deal. So if there are people here dabbling, here in main campus dabbling in witchcraft, it's not a reason to freak out. We pray and we send the gospel. That's all we do. Um, I forget your last one, but we can talk after this. Yeah. Yeah, if you can shout it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so praise the Lord. Yeah, I want to thank you again for, for that exposition. And uh, mine is uh, 
is concerning the new converts. What are some of the things you would recommend to be taught to new believers? Because one of the things I believe has really messed up the church is believers really born again, truly born again, but the way they get incorporated in their faith and taught, that's where we have in chaos and false teachers and all that. And some of them you can't blame. It's how they found the church, where they were raised up, and all those doctrines. And the other thing is, uh, yeah, yeah, concerning that, what, what, what should you recommend to be taught as they begin? And I don't want to call them doctrines, but there are some which are quite hard. And I don't know how you should work with a disciple. It's one of the hardest things if you're not really equipped. And the other thing you can mention something on, because I'm really interested in this, on prayer. I realize we, we as Christians and most of us pray as the Bible says amiss because we don't know how to pray. And as Christ, this is one of the things the disciples requested Christ to teach them in Luke 11, how to pray despite them walking with him for some time. And you can highlight on some issues about, I don't know about witchcraft, maybe what he asked is, uh, should okay mine is can christians be demon possessed truly born again christians and what should we do maybe to demons is it bind lose and if that going back to that scripture matthew 16 and 18 you can speak from the context as you have taught and other things about prayer please thank you some really good questions that would take me half a day to answer, but um, I'll try and give the cliff notes. So the first question is a question about discipleship for new converts, okay? Um, let me give an illustration. In my language, there's a name called Oweti. It means the one who was thrown away. The way it would work is there was a superstition. If a lady kept having kids and they die, you'd have a kid and put him just outside the gate Okay, and then someone would come and say, oh, he's been thrown away, he's been thrown away, and if they bring it in, then bring the baby in, then that baby would leave, etc., etc. The idea, okay, for, so forget the, the mythology, but the idea is if you throw away a child, they will eventually die, right? And you're spot on when you say we need to raise them and ground them. There's no one size fits all, but there are some principles that need to be there. Number one, they need to be taught spiritual disciplines. Prayer, reading the word. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that illustration of the navigators. So at the center, if they have Christ in their lives, they need to learn how to pray, to communicate with the Lord. They need to know how to go deep in their word. So teach them how to have a quiet time. Teach them how to study the Bible. That's on us. Okay? They need to learn how to be a member of a church, of a good Bible-believing, gospel-centered church. But even at that young age, they need to learn how to tell others about their faith at that young spiritual age. Okay, it doesn't mean they start crusades, but they start sharing their faith. When they're doing that, they'll be in action. As Christians, they'll be in action. So that's the matter of discipleship. Teach them spiritual disciplines. As a personal practice, and you don't have to do this, I'd say work through the book of John with them. Work through the book of the Gospel of John, and then work through First John with them. They'll read through John, get a good picture of the character of Christ. They'll read through First John, get a good picture of their assurance in Christ, that Christ will never leave them nor forsake them. Because that's what the book of First, Second, and Third John are about, being assured of our faith. Um, the second one was not, the last one was about uh, binding, and etc. The second one was about prayer, right? Specifically, what about prayer? Just remind me. How to be effective in prayer, okay. Um, now, I think all of us, I've never met anyone who says, I have a wonderful prayer life. I have a great prayer life. The people who talk like that, I'm, the wor I'm worried about them. Because, they, they, yeah, that kind of pride is not usually found in people who are genuinely praying. Eh? I, I don't think, as best I can tell from Scripture, 
I don't think there's any silver bullet in effectiveness in prayer. I don't think there's any way to make our prayers effective. Eh? What makes our prayers effective is Christ. We have one who is on the right hand of the Father interceding for us. Scripture says in Romans 8 that the Spirit communicates with groans beyond our understanding to God because he understands the mind of God. Okay? So even when we pray amiss, Christ helps that. He redeems that. Okay? So what makes effective prayer, I would say, is praying. Just keep praying. <laughs> There's no silver bullet there. We just pray. We pray in faith, trusting God. We pray believing that he knows what is best. We pray knowing that he will do what is best. We pray because he says you have not because you ask not. We know that prayer is the slender nerve that moves the hand of omnipotence. And so we pray. God will do what he's doing with that. Okay? But we trust that he knows what is good. Revelation chapter 8 says that our prayers, paints this brilliant picture, our prayers is like incense that rises to the very throne room of God and then there's thunder and lightning and peals and shaking on the earth. The picture is God hears those prayers and he responds. And he responds in his wisdom. I think it's Genesis 18, 25 that says, will not the judge of all the earth do what is right? So we trust him to do what is right. Now that story for binding and loosing, eh? <sighs> okay. We don't have the time to go through Matthew 16, verse 18, uh, and, and 18. But before we even talk about the principle of binding and loosing demons, let's just think about it, guys, eh, for one second. If I bound this demon this week, how come it showed up next week, man? Does that make sense? Just the 30 second, you know, sensible question. If we bound a demon, how did it get loosed again? I don't think that's what that verse is talking about. When Jesus talks about, I think it's in Luke 11, binding the strong man, what he's saying is, me, I'm not going after these too small, too small to demons. I'm cutting off the head of the snake. Genesis 3, 15. And the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. That's what Jesus did on the cross. He destroyed the powers of Satan. Scripture says he made a shame of him. He's a disarmed enemy. So Jesus isn't too concerned with is there a daimon or here, is there a daimon or there. No, he already crushed their leader, trampled him underfoot. That's why the gospel matters. Because when someone believes that, a Christian cannot be demon-possessed. Simple. Okay? As it is, Ephesians will talk about how we have been seated with Christ, positionally. Satan can't exist there. It's like you trying to breathe in space. It's not going to happen. What is true, and by the way, it's a very unfortunate, if you read, I like, that's why I like the ESV, it's an unfortunate translation. The word in Greek, daimonizomai, does not mean possessed by a demon. It means to have a demon like attached to you, but it has not taken over all your functions. Does that make sense? Okay. So, unbelievers can have a demon. Believers can't. They can't. Now, can you be harassed by Satan? Yes. Will you be tempted by Satan? So was Christ. Right? Paul says you put on the armor of God because he has fiery arrows that he's shooting at you and I all the time. That's going to happen. That's great. I mean, that's why we are called soldiers of Christ. You're not called a soldier because you're hanging out playing badminton. We are at war. <laughs> we are at war with the enemy. But he can never possess us. We are already possessed by Christ. Yeah. So what do we do with demons? The same thing. We pray, we preach, we trust. And God will be happy to expel them in the lives of unbelievers. Okay. I don't think I have any more time. Um, but if there's an inter interactive session after this, if you want to ask more questions, I'm happy to um, answer those questions as long as I can. And I think I'll invite Sarah Joy or James or somebody. <laughs> right. God bless you guys.